Our scripture reading this morning will come from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. I'll be reading from the New International Version. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whatever you bind on earth, be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Well, good morning. I'm kind of on an emotional high right now. I'm just uh, returning from Israel, but um, two days later being able to give a presentation about um, what the trip was like and even why we went on that trip. Uh, This summer, Tony and I, we were presented with an opportunity that we kind of felt like we couldn't refuse. And uh, some friends of ours, um, he had retired from the military as a three-star vice admiral. And um, as you can imagine how um, active a vice admiral would be and on his approaching retirement was like, what do I do? And so his next step was to buy into a travel agency. And one of the things that he was wanting to do is to create opportunities for people to visit the Holy Lands. Really good um, brother and sister in Christ, and we just love the relationship that we have with them. And so they presented us an opportunity to go on this trip to Israel as kind of a a familiarization trip um, to see what would it be like if we went back in the future to uh, take groups. And so that's what the trip was about. Um, While I was there... Uh, we visited 30 different sites. Um, that's not 30 different things. That's 30 different locations that we went to. And so if you can imagine there's no way that I'm going to be able to go through all of the places that we went while we were there. So I just wanted to kind of whet your appetite a little bit. Um, as we go in here, if you look at this, as we went into Jerusalem, You might think, oh, it's just like a city of ruins. And one of the things that caught me off off guard as we went into the old city is it's still functioning. There's still thousands of people living in old Jerusalem. And uh, there's shops and there's different areas. And there's a Christian quarter. There's a Muslim quarter. There's a Turkish quarter. There's an Armenian quarter. There's a Jewish quarter. And life is going on. What you are looking at right here is they're still functioning off of the original walls of the city that were built. And so what this is, is this is the daily trash that goes through town to pick up the trash. And they have to use vehicles like this. The tires were really flat, and they would just go up and down those stairs and take the trash out of the city. And that's as it passed about two inches from us as we stood against the wall for it to go by. Um, there, w- there wasn't Starbucks. Um, in Israel, but um, we may do because they have a stars and butts, okay? And uh, so, uh, but an interesting thing, you know, as you go and visit another culture, um, there's still cultural nuances that you have to get get used to. And one of the things that we got used to was that, yes, they serve lots and lots of coffee while you're there, but also when can you have coffee? Um, we were practicing a lot of the hotels that we stayed with. Um, they were kosher hotels. And just like in the States, if you were going to open a restaurant and you might want to get a liquor license, you have to get a kosher license. And uh, at dinner, I like to have uh, some coffee after dinner, and there was never coffee at dinner. And so we asked, and they said, well, the reason why you can't have coffee after dinner is because it would most people would put creamer in their coffee and we serve meat at dinner and if you mix the the dairy with the meat that would affect our kosher license and 
So we're not able to do that. Whereas in the mornings, they didn't serve meat at breakfast, so you could have coffee and creamer at breakfast. And that was just one of those interesting nuances that, that um, we experienced while we were there. Another thing that was interesting about the different sites that we went to is if you're visiting a site, don't imagine I'm looking exactly what they saw in the first century. Because what has happened over the centuries is you take a place like where the birth of Jesus took place or where the crucifixion took place or some major event like the Sermon on the Mount or um, some key event like Peter being ex reinstated by Jesus. And you take those things and what they've done is just built some kind of monument or church or basilica over that place. And so you walk in and it looks very ornate and it doesn't look anything like you would imagine what it would look like in the first century. And so we got into a conversation with our tour guide and said, well, how do you feel about that? And he said, well, the truth is, is if these churches or cathedrals or basilicas weren't built around them, then they would probably have like a condominium or something built over it. And so it's just, what are you going to choose? But Nevertheless, it was still an amazing experience to be able to see the things that Jesus and the apostles saw to go to the places um, that he went. Another thing that's really exciting is um, just how close we were to some other areas of modern day conflict. Um, if you look at this picture right now, you may not be able to read it very well, but it says um, border ahead. That is right there on the Jordan River. Um, this is the more, what I feel like is more realistic place where John the Baptist um, may have been baptizing people. We went to one place on the Jordan and it was very pretty and neat and decorated. And I'm like, do they have a water filtration system in here? Because this water is like super clear. So I asked our tour guide, I said, can you take us to where you think it really was? And he said, let me try to work that out. And he worked it in. But the reason why there's a border crossing there is where I was standing, where that picture was taken, I'm in Israel. And straight across from there is Jordan. And if you notice some of the conflict, but right there is a soldier looking at us. I, you can't see him very well because I took the picture discreetly. Um, and then just off in the distance, I mean, just right there on the Jordan River, you can see the Jordan flag flying on the on the other side. But uh, Things like that, or we went to the way north part of Israel and we were looking at Tel Dan, where the tribe of Dan was, and just right right there you can see Lebanon. I said, man, we're just so close, I want to just walk over there just say that I went to Lebanon while I was there as well. And he said, well, if you notice all these giant signs, there's landmines all throughout there because of conflict that's taken place over over recent years. And so... We're in a place visiting the Holy Lands, but also walking around in, um, you just cross a border and you're entering into places where there's been recent conflict. Um, that being said, no, at no time did Tony and I feel like we were in danger or that our, we were getting into some kind of trouble. It was an amazing experience. Another thing that was interesting in your mind, you might have... Um, imagery of what something was like in the first century. Uh, what do you guys think that might be? Any guesses? Yeah, it's a manger. First century manger, you know, and so the mangers that we see at a lot of nativity scenes or maybe we, how we've imagined it in our mind, um, that is a, uh, that's what it was probably like in the first century. And the reason why they made them that way is they were a lot easier to clean. They were a lot more stable, that you didn't have to worry about them breaking. Um, any guess what that might be? Uh, this is whenever I visited Tana in Galilee. That could be a little hint to you guys. That's a water jar. Okay, that's a giant water jar. You look in there, that's, how, that's where all of the water would have gone. And so when Jesus did that miracle of changing water and wine, you're looking, you're like, man, that was a lot of wine. Because it wasn't just one water jar, but the reason why it's designed the way that it is, is those thick walls are actually what keep it really cool. And so that's the way that they designed it the way that they did. Uh, this right here um, was, while we're on the trip, there, as I mentioned, there's some plate, 
I can't cover everything that we talked about or saw while we were there, but there were a few places that really impacted me, and I wanted, I wanted to share a little bit about this. But this is just right on the edge of Galilee, but this is the site where they think Jesus reinstated Peter, where the great catch of fish took place. Uh, and just for me, it was just interesting some of the things that were pointed out that um, even whenever you look at the Greek text, that the fire that Peter stood around when he be betrayed Jesus is the same Greek word as the fire that Jesus made when he reinstates Peter and he's cooking the fish over on the side. And it just, when you're standing in a place, and I know you've read the story a thousand times, but part of the experience is, man, I am standing, maybe it wasn't this exact spot, but it's probably within 150 yards of where, where this took place. But just standing there and reading through those texts afresh and realizing that all of us are sinners, all of us have betrayed Jesus, and just as much as Jesus reinstated Peter, he wants to reinstate us, and he just wants us to be part of that. So that was a really powerful moment that I had as I stood um, right there on the edge of, of Galilee. Um, another thing it, that really affected me, and this is why we had Dennis read the scripture reading that he read, but this is um, Caesarea Philippi, okay? And in Caesarea Philippi, this is where Jesus took his apostles with him and said, who do, you, who do people say that I am? And one of the things that really impacted me on this trip is if you look at this picture here, this is what they think it probably, it looked something similar to this in the first century, that at that very location in Caesarea Philippi, there is a place that is actually called the Gates of Hell. And what they felt like was what, there was a stream that run, ran through there, and in ancient times, that would where is where you would get access to the underworld. And so, as you stood there, that um, there were different gods, and people would come to do their worship. And so, this is what it looked like. But this is just on site, right there in Caesarea Philippi. That was a temple to Zeus, and there was also a temple to Pan. And as you walk, I mean. A size maybe a little bit larger than this room. There's di different idols, ruins of different idols, temples. And so it kind of changed the way that I saw these things as I think about Jesus saying, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, or the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Because as Jesus is saying there, and he says, upon this rock I'll build my church, talking about the confession that Peter made, Yes, it's the confession that Peter made, but as he's standing there, he's standing right before the gates of hell, and he says, the gates of hell will not prevail against what I have to bring into the kingdom. And so for me, I'm like, wow, I've always thought that passage was awesome, and now I think it's even more awesome because I'm standing at this site and realizing that it wasn't that Jesus was making a statement. It was very intentional because it was about a 12-mile hike to get there. So it wasn't like, hey, let's go across the street and see what will happen. It, it was very intentional when Jesus took them to that specific place to say, all of the gods, anything else besides me have nothing to stand against what I have to bring into the kingdom. Um, there were other things that caught me, um, that surprised me. For example, when we first flew into Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv is where ancient Joppa is. And Joppa is where Peter had the vision of, um, here's the meat, kill and eat. And um, he had that vision, and then Cornelius sent his servants from, um, from Caesarea, which isn't Caesarea Philippi, it's off the coast. There's Caesarea, there's Caesarea Philippi. But in Caesarea, it's, just, it's, it's further down the coast, but we went to Joppa to see just be there where that vision took place. And then we drove up to Caesarea and I was like, that's a pretty good drive. Um, and that, and that's us driving. It took us an hour to drive there. So to realize that walking there, that would be a pretty good journey for them to go. But um, realizing that as in the past, whenever I've read that text and in, in acts that I thought like, well, he had the vision and he crossed the street and he went and met with Cornelius. And it was like, well, it's nothing like that at all, that they traveled a really good distance for that to take place at the same time. So that's me reflecting on, man, that was way farther than what I realized. 
at the same time, whenever I was in Jerusalem, you can it's like a 20-minute walk from Bethany. So whenever you think of John chapter 11 and Lazarus and Jesus knowing that Lazarus is sick and he's only like a 20-minute walk away, and he waits days before he can go there, and you realize, man, he could have gone there pretty easily, but he chose not to. And you can see the intentionality in what he did. Uh, this picture right here is a really powerful picture to me, and I'm glad that I got the opportunity to go and see this. Um, this is um, known as cave number four, um, even though it was the first cave that they went into, but in the archaeological site, it's cave number four. But this is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Um, Ninety percent of what was found was in this cave right here. And um, it's just a little boy. I think a lot of you have heard the story is just throwing stones as he's herding sheep and he hears a crash that doesn't sound like a normal crash. And he goes in and he finds these scrolls. But the reason why this find was so powerful is because before the earliest manuscripts that we had were maybe around 6th century of what we're reading. And so a the skeptic would say, well, you don't know if they've changed the text. You don't know if there's something different. And so these, a lot of these texts that were in these scrolls date back even to the first century. And as they began to look at those texts, they could see that they were exactly the same as the texts that the Jews are reading today, which confirms the um, preciseness of everything that took place in the translations that they were doing. Uh, this is where it was found, and this is what led to all of this being excavated. As they began to excavate all of this, they realized that this was actually a city. Um, they found um, bathhouses and places for ceremonial washing. But another thing that is really interesting to me, and some of it may be speculation, but just the fact that it was said was really powerful to me, is if, if I'm looking at that cave right now, and I turn directly around, I'm looking across the, the Dead Sea. And if I, as I look across the Dead Sea, there's a mountain in the distance, and that's where Moses stood to overlook the promised land that he wasn't able to enter into. And so a lot of people think that it was very intentional that it's at this location um, where they were trying to flee, kind of like how when the United States was beginning, the, they left so that they could have their religious freedoms. This is all taking place in the 60s, right before Titus comes in and destroys the temple. And so as people fled, they fled over to this area, where ha had their life going on here, and then the scrolls ultimately ended up being placed in these different caves. So that was really powerful for me to realize that the scriptures that we are reading today are just as accurate today as they were years and years ago. Uh, this was a moment for me. That is an olive tree. Okay, and this is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as you look at this, that, that one there on the right, um, that's over 2,000 years old. And uh, you, I, I'm a person, I, I'm, I'm a pretty objective person. And so me going to Israel wasn't for me to become a believer. I was going to be a believer no matter what. Uh, I already was a believer. And so this wasn't going to make me a believer, but it solidified and it just brought an emotional aspect to my relationship with the Lord that I just can't explain. And uh, there is this moment that I had that everybody was um, walking around in the Garden of Gethsemane and I'm standing here and I kind of went off on my own and I'm just reading through all the Gethsemane passages. And then as I'm reading John chapter 17, I'm reading through that whole prayer in John chapter 17, and it is uh, it be, was 12 o'clock. And I'm reading this, and you realize that in that moment that I'm reading, it's crunch time. Jesus knows that he's getting ready to go to the cross after this time in the garden. Judas comes and kisses him and betrays him. Well, I'm reading that text, and it turns noon, and because of the cathedral that's right there, um, you just hear dong, 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 you know, just as I'm reading that text, and it just did something for me to realize that I could feel the emotion and just the intensity of 
at this place, Jesus prayed, and just very a very few moments afterwards, he was led to his trial, um, which we got to see some ruins of where we think that trial probably took place. And then you think about the Kidron Valley, and the Kidron Valley goes all the way from Jerusalem all the way down to the Dead Sea. It's really long. But its width is, you could probably throw a stone across it. Well, maybe I could. You probably could. So. <laughs> but uh, I'm guessing, uh, it, it, my guess is maybe, maybe 300 yards straight across. You know, and so it's not as big in width as you would imagine in your mind. But um, moments like this really, when you're able to stand at the place where these events happen, um, it just really does something for you emotionally. Um, That's within the Garden of Gethsemane as well. Um, This right here, I'm sure you guys know what this is, but this is the wall, right, where everyone goes and prays. And um, I was joking with Paul this morning. I said, and it's not any different than churches in the United States. There were way more women there than there were men. And uh, I think just women are more spiritual than, than men. But um, they're standing there, and as you know, they're praying for the Messiah to come. And uh, I went and I had a powerful moment where I went up to the wall and put my hands on the wall and I prayed and I prayed three things. I, I, I prayed first that, uh, that the Jewish people will come to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Um, secondly, um, I prayed that Jesus would come in our lifetime. And um, third, I prayed that God would use me as an instrument to bring as many people into the kingdom to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And so there's powerful moments that you get to have like that that you're not going to get in a book. Just like even as they say a picture's worth a thousand words, I was there and just being there is worth 10,000 words. And so as we think about that's a kid's bar mitzvah that was going on at the wall while we were there. But as you think about um, the impact, and even as I mentioned, kind of the high that I'm on right now, um, one of the things as I've reflected about it is I just want to talk about Jesus. Um, I to the point where I was I was at a dinner Thursday night, and I you know how you have your inner dialogue, and I had to tell myself, Corey, shut up. You know, <laughs> it's like you're annoying people because you're just like, hey. I just want to tell you about this experience that I had. But I've been thinking about, well, what do you do from here? Um, What what do you do with that experience, especially with the chat, the opportunity that Tony and I had to be able to go and see these places? And the thing for me is I don't want it just to be for us. I want it to be I want to create an opportunity for as many people to have the same experience that I had as possible. I've already had some conversation with Jeff Smith about what if we work together, aim and disciple trips to create senior trips. And we had a senior trip where we took groups of people there to see it. And they're on this high. And then we said, what if you wanted to take part in the mission of God as the next step of having this experience? Um, People in this area being able to go and have this experience because what it does is when you come back, you're just excited to continue telling the story of what Jesus has done. Uh, that passage that that Dennis read, um, I see that in an incredibly powerful light to realize that what Jesus said over 2,000 years ago is true, that the gates of Hades will not prevail against what Jesus has to offer. For us. So thank you for the opportunity to share with you guys and uh, hope you guys get an opportunity to experience what we experience.